mostly blue belt at Taekwondo means stop with the kicking, what do you do? <laughs> and then, and hand surgery, that's fresh. And uh, I can show you pictures of broken toes. Uh, broken them three times. Uh, got, got a toe caught in a man's belly button. Um, there's a thing, I think the Taekwondo martial art people? Which, which one? Aikido? Taekwondo? Okay, so you know uh, um, a, uh, uh, not a hook kick, but a twist kick? So I twist kicked and I got my, th my, my pinky toe caught in his belly button. And then, and then I went down and the toe stayed in his belly. <laughs> so it kind of like, you know, and it, uh, so now that toe is kind of like, hey, uh, in the other direction, which is fun. But this is what we do when we have a midlife crisis, right? <laughs> How can I prove I still have worth? Beat up other fat men. So I did that tonight, and that's why I'm late, and thank you for your patience. All right, cool. Uh, my name is Scott. I am uh, always, when I give a talk, concerned about uh, the expensive meeting calculator. You go and just figure everybody makes 50 bucks an hour, and you do the math, and you go, holy crap, it's like a $12,000 meeting that we're at right now, and I don't want to like piss anyone off. So feel free to vote with your feet. If you think that this sucks, there's a Chipotle down the street. I'll meet you there after. I don't in any way want to waste your time. Certainly also, I think it would be enjoyable, since we have a reasonably sized group here, that I shouldn't be talking at you. This shouldn't be a conversation like wah, 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 wah. It should be more like this, because we're all friends and peers. So we can maybe, I can share a couple of thoughts and some things that I'm currently thinking about, and then we can have a, a bit of a conversation, if that makes sense. What, uh, so a little bit of context, if you have no idea who I am. Uh, if you have a projector that works, did the projector not go on? Because it's like, I'm looking at the projector. Button and very no, you actually have a hide button. Yeah. Hide video. I'm going to push that. This thing runs Java, and that user group is not here right now. There we go. Got it. Cool. Yay. Uh, so yeah, uh, my name is Scott, and I've been in Portland forever, my whole life, since day one. Um, and I uh, grew up on the. Uh, actually, let's see if we can turn the lights out. Actually, maybe in the on this side. I grew up in Northeast Portland. I moved to Beaverton, and and hung out with Kristen in middle school. Uh, and uh, we both became programmers, so we got that going for us. We're the only ones that got off the tough streets of Beaverton, uh, <laughs> which was cool. Um, now, I um, have been blogging for a non-trivial amount of time, and actually, if you go out there and Google with Bing uh, for Scott, <laughs> there's uh, Scott Sports, Scott Brand Toilet Paper, these bastards. Uh, that, it, it all went south with a restricted trademark. I used to be first like literally on the home page of Google when you search for Scott, and then all of the, uh, the other Scots came around, and now I'm like second behind whoever this schmuck is, right? 150 years. I mean, what is that really, <laughs> right? So, yeah, so if you go and Google for Scott, you know, I'm one of the top Scots in the area. Uh, and uh, I blogged before it was called a blog, and that is kind of my claim to fame. is isn't blogging, but it's rather not stopping blogging. So I'm just going to go to my blog archives. I'm going to just hold down the, uh, the space bar and uh, look at some of the stuff that I've been blogging about. So this is probably going back, I want to say, 16, 17, 18, 18 years. And uh, I have a bit of a reputation of being productive. Um, but that, that, I, I don't believe in hustle culture, and I want to talk about that, because a lot of people that obsess about this kind of stuff, and I'm still going, by the way, uh, get, oh, and I also have a, uh, a podcast that you should all listen to. My last name is, is Hanselman, Hanselman, like Hansel and Gretel man. And uh, I have a podcast. I have done, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. come on, podcast. This will be the one, like, 33 years ago I started the podcast right now. This is episode 721. And one of the things that's worth pointing out about my podcast is that most podcasts, no disrespect if you have a podcast, uh, are two white guys on Skype talking about JavaScript. And uh, I made a podcast many, many, many years ago, hundreds of podcasts ago. I want to point out that I'm still pressing space. Uh, and I'm having no trouble finding really qualified women and people of color. Isn't that a funny thing with that pipeline, that crazy pipeline problem that we're having? <laughs> Just a challenge. Anyway. Uh, having absolutely no issue putting on a show for 700 episodes. That's every single Thursday for the last 700 episodes. So I got a podcast, I got a blog, and none of it's my job. Okay, uh, so I 
tweeted about this because I was like kind of feeling myself a little bit. And I was like, hey, you know, good job for not quitting. Um, and someone's like, ah, I don't like the way that you're, um, you're, you're, what, what was the word that they said? I was like, me, like the, you know, the San, San Francisco Bay hustle culture, like always be hustling. You know, you're not, your, your, your company failed because you didn't try hard enough. That's bullshit, right? I don't like that. So I'm not trying to say, hey, look at me, I'm productive. You need to try harder. What I'm saying is that through focus and deliberate practice and absolute choice about what I wanted to be doing at the time, I was able to do these things while also having a job. And that is what I think productivity means. And when people go out and say, oh, well, you know, it's about lists or it's about this or it's about that, I think it's more about intentionality and more about what they call deliberate practice. Is anyone into deliberate practice? You know what that is? Right? It's a kind of, it's productivity plus mindfulness and being thoughtful. Right? You, you, you don't get to watch nine hours of a Netflix show and then wonder why you didn't get anything done that day. Now, the alternative, the flip side of that is like, well, I needed that, that time, that binge to recharge. Like I owed that to myself. So it's important that I and no one ever go and take your recharging time and make you feel bad for it. Like, you know why you didn't get that code done. It was that nine hours of watching whatever on Netflix. That's not, that's like binge shaming, right? But at the same time, if you complain about that nine hours, then you have to ask yourself, well, maybe I should have just done seven and then blogged for two hours or studied or learned Spanish or got my blue belt or whatever, right? So what I am kind of against, if I can be against something, is people complaining about not getting stuff done when they just kind of like do other, they find stuff to do other stuff. Someone at work was saying, I don't know how you find time to blog. And they, I was like, well, you, you poop every day, right? And they were like, well, yeah, sometimes twice. I was like, twice, whoa. I mean, that's, that's a level of productive that I would only aspire to. Uh, that, that's amazing. It must be really important to you. And they were like, yeah. And I was like, so you do find time for things that are important. And, then, and I was like trying to understand that like, to do these things, to talk to people, to blog, to learn, to whatever, is important to me. Therefore, I make time for it. And I set up systems by which I can be successful. A lot of times when we want to be productive, we set up systems that are guilt systems. That is the exact opposite of what you want to do. You want to set up a success system that inspires you to succeed rather than shaming you. Does everyone have that big book pile on their desk and they get like the Ruby way somewhere in the middle of the thing and then every once in a while you'll like pick the Ruby way up and you'll put it on top and like this is the time I'm going to read the Ruby way. You know, and it, it, you're never going to read that pile. That book pile is a monument to your failure. And it sits there every day. And you're like, we got it on the ground, or it's here, or it's whatever. And it's just books you're not going to read. And it exists, and there's a tiny little voice in your head that says, you suck. So I realized that rather than having a pile of books I'm not going to read, I literally let some of them go. And I make small piles of books that I actually read. Like two or three. Just a reasonable number. And then when they're gone, I actually feel successful. And I'm like, oh, wow, that was awesome. Because it doesn't feel good to read one book in a pile of 11. But it does feel very one or two out of a pile of one or two. Does that make sense? So setting measurable goals, right? Like I don't have any uh, any illusions that I'm going to be good at Taekwondo, but at least I'm going, you know, twice a week, and that's important to me. And the idea that it's a marathon, whether it be the blog or the podcast, it looks like a lot of productivity. But let's look at the blog, for example. Let's go by date. Let's look at 2019. So here's the blog going all the way back to 2002. Okay, so what do we notice about the blog? Let's just look February, March, April, May. What are we seeing here? Twice a week. Not four times a week. Like, do you have a blog? Do you have a blog? So you should blog five times a week. Oh my God, I went to this talk and Hanselman was great and he guilted me into five times a week. I'm going to go from zero to five times a week. And that will work for exactly two and a half days and you'll miss one, and then you're going to feel bad about yourself. And then your very last blog post that people visit when they go to your blog is going to be four years ago. And it's going to be like, I know I haven't blogged lately, but I'm rededicating myself to blogging. right? So then you're going to come and want to get a job, and then I'm going to Google you, and then I'm going to find that your last blog post was four years ago, and it was you saying, I'm going to blog more. And it's just, uh, then it's a thing. right? So for me, twice a week was an amount that was like non-threatening. But what's amazing about that is twice a week, that's 100 times a year. Holy shit, that's like 100 pages, that's like a book. You know what I mean? 
And a hundred times a year, like if you, if you, do you have a blog? Okay, you do not have a blog. If you blog twice a week for 17 years, you will be a moderately successful Pacific Northwest technologist in an obscure space of some renown. <laughs> like, yeah, she's like, check box, right? That's going on my LinkedIn, you know what I mean? I, I told my, uh, my, my dad was like, you know, people kind of know you. And I was like, I'm kind of the Bruce Campbell of programming. Five of you laugh because you know who Bruce Campbell is, and five of you are like, who the fuck is Bruce Campbell? Exactly. That's me. Who the Hanselman? Who's Hanselman? No, because Bruce Campbell, Bruce Campbell, it's that guy from that thing. Right? He's just, he's that character actor from that thing. You know, you're that guy. That, 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 yeah, yeah, that's me, but for computers, which means nothing. That's not even like a guest star on Law and Order. So we all have to like, lower our expectations about what are doing. So then I started thinking about, well, who am I doing this for? Who am I writing this blog post for? Here's the trick, though, friends. Let us do, 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 blog, PowerPoint, PowerPoint, PowerPoint. Do, do. Why am I blogging about stuff? The biggest thing that keeps people from blogging is this idea that, well, who am I? What do I know? Right? Who am I to blog about Ruby? Right? I did Ruby for like three years when it first came out. I did Rails and like Rails 1. I shouldn't be blogging. I, don't know, I have no authority of any kind. So I did this blog post. I got a 3D printer. This is one of my most popular blog posts ever. The basics of 3D printing from someone with 16 whole hours experience. I just, I just owned it. Like I have been 3D printing for a weekend. And I just wrote up like the whole experience. And people love that stuff. But who am I writing it for though, right? Uh, am I like a famous blogger? No, I get decent numbers, but I'm not like Gruber or one of these people. Right? It's not my job, it's a side hustle. So why? Let's say that you email me and you say, uh, oh, you have a question? Yes, what do you got? Oh, you want to make an observation? Oh, no. People need to look at that blog because it's cool. It's like when you were, when some of us were. That, that's cool. A band name, you buy the album just because it's a band name is clever. Okay. So you you like you thought that was a a, a good hook. That I would click right? on that. Right. Really? That's just funny. What other funny things you got in there? Mm. <laughs> Square foot gardening for programmers. <laughs> That's a thing. I actually have that. So, let's say that you email me afterwards and you're like, "Awesome talk. Here's a great question." She's got a great question. And I go, "Holy crap, that was a great question. I'm glad she emailed me." I don't know you, right? I'm not going to give you the gift of my keystrokes. Like, she's had this amazing question. Oh, I should have thought about that. I should have talked. Shoot. Eh. Like, I only have so many keystrokes left. Like, you may, be, you may feel young, but you have a finite number of keystrokes left in your hands before you die. How old are you? How, to, how fast do you type? Not very. Not very. Uh, we'll say 60. You have 207 million keystrokes left. It's going down, by the way. I just want to point that out. It's actually going <laughs> as we sit here. That is, assuming that you live to 90, you have 60 years of typing left. That's four hours a day, nothing but typing. That is 67 novels that you could potentially write. So get on that. Feel bad. 414 medium-sized computer programs or a million emails to your boss. <laughs> okay, so she emails me this like super awesome question and I'm like, oh dude, great question. Um, but I'm not going to give her 2,000 keystrokes like for free? No, like not going to happen. Where can I put those keystrokes? Where can I put them? I can put them anywhere with a URL. Doesn't matter. Blog. Maybe not medium. Don't put them in walled gardens because walled gardens suck. But somewhere with a URL. And then I email you a link to that thing. And then she sends it to one friend. I just doubled my keystroke potential. Like it's literally that e e easy. K email is where your keystrokes go to die. They're a huge waste of time. Nobody reads your emails. Nobody prints an email out and puts it on the wall unless it has a password in it. Nobody laminates. 
Like they just emails are just trash, it's dumpster fire for your hands and your tendons. And when your hands start going, when you're old like me, you're gonna regret a lot of those emails. So every single time someone writes you an email, you, I love that you're nodding. You're like, yes, like this is exactly the thing. Put it in a knowledge base article, a wiki, for God's sake, SharePoint if you have to, OneNote, literally anywhere, and then send a link. And then if she sends it to two people or three people or 10, if only five people read your blog, your million keystrokes becomes five million keystrokes. So I've been doing that for the last 17 years, consistently. I don't email people stuff. Anytime someone has a question about something, like for example, if someone wants to come on my podcast, I realized after about three times that I kept typing the same crap. So I made a one pager called Hansel Minutes slash get set, guest set up and says, hey, you're gonna be a guest on our show. And then I realized that I was typing that URL a lot. And then I made an auto hotkey to just go like shift alt H and then it like prints out the URL. Like anytime, this is the whole point, right? Every time that you can automate stuff, automate stuff. Like seriously, dry. That's the whole thing about Rails, right? Just don't repeat yourself, don't repeat yourself, don't repeat yourself. You see the irony? So anytime that you can, yeah, eh? it's a joke grenade. It'll get you a little bit later. I'm always slow. No, it's totally fine. You were laughing at the opening, I understand. The minute after the comedian does the riff, I'll be like, <laughs> that is no, That's not weird at all. Nothing wrong with that. So, I'm not writing the blogs for you or for the audience in any way, and that's the thing. People say, well, how do you, why do you have a podcast? How do you pick your people? Well, you know how people are always when they're early in career? How many people are early in career here? Early in career, like less than five years, less than 10 years? Okay, cool. One of the things that you're gonna to wanna to do a lot is like call people and ask them to take you to coffee. I got a minimum number of coffees left. Like this, I can, I can measure coffees. And again, I don't mean to overly pivot on age a little bit, but I'm pushing 50 and that gets you thinking, right? My dad's like 75. So let's assume he's around for 20 more years and that's optimal and he's kosher and, and I see him once a week. I can measure the number of lunches we have left. That's how you start thinking at this age. So a very nice young, young person says, can I have coffee with you? Am I taking that, is that a lunch with my dad? Is that a lunch with my kids? My 14 year old's 14, I got only four years with that kid. That's a 1200 days and he's gone and I'll probably never talk to him again. That's what the kids do, right? And that's a problem. So how do I scale something like that? Give talks, write blog posts, do YouTubes, anything at all where I can get the word out Mentorship rings. I've got a mentorship group of about 60 people and we go and we pair off into little groups and then we meet up so I can, I can't do one-on-one -on -one mentoring because it just doesn't scale. But this is my obsession. I recognize that there is value in singular one-on-one -on -one time with individuals and there are people that I do have that time with. But if someone says, hey, can I have coffee with you early in career? Not really. Now, when I was early in career, I wanted to have coffee with all kinds of cool people, but they don't have time either. But you tell them, would you like to be on my podcast? You freaking love that. So the podcast has been a long con. The whole podcast is an excuse for me to talk to people that would normally not talk to me. This guy here, just talk to this guy. His dad was the first black software engineer in America in 1946. Just wrote a New York Times best-selling book. I would love to freaking have coffee with this guy. But if we all email him simultaneously and say, can we have coffee? Why is he gonna pick me? But I emailed him and I said, would you like to be in my podcast? And he said, will you push my book? And I was like, hell yeah, I'll push your book. Buy the book. <laughs> I have gotten to talk to all kinds of cool people on the show. DHH is in there somewhere. Matt's. Japanese dude, nice, nice guy. Uh, Martin Fowler, uh, what's, uh, where's DHH? Hannah, how do you spell Hannah Meyer? Oh, I, I must have changed the thing. I talked to Martin and, and David and Hannah Meyer Hansen in 2007. Again, two people who I have no business talking to, but I had a podcast, right? You too can have a podcast. It doesn't matter if no one listens to it. People just, they don't ask, no one has ever asked me but how many people listen to your podcast? Oh, just me. I just want to have lunch with you and record, record it. That's not weird at all, no. It's not. 
You make a good looking page like this, good. I honestly have no idea how many people listen to this show. But I have this wonderful wall of faces and I literally went to the lawyer just a couple of days ago and I put together a digital will to make sure that my domains and things will remain. So well, this will go read only and I will be gone. And that's 360 hours of somewhat meaningful content. Isn't that cool? So it only takes me about two and a half hours a week to do the podcast and the blog. It's minimal. So I want you to think about the kinds of stuff that you want to do and the kinds of value that you want to provide and if you're excited about it. Now I'm not saying that everyone needs to go and do this, but I am mindful about it. If I choose to not do a show one week, then what, is that, what does that mean? Do I, do I lose something? Do I lose momentum? Um, in this case here, if I look at my calendar, actually I, I won't bring my calendar up because it's internal. Um, I've got three podcasts recording at lunchtime on Thursday. That'll get three weeks out of the way. So then I can take time off. I actually took off eight weeks and we lived in South Africa last year and I kept the podcast going because I pre-recorded shows. And then I hired a person on Fiverr to go and like publish the shows and then I added a little bit of code to my podcast site to invalidate the cache and auto-publish the shows on every Thursday. Isn't that cool? So I can now go up here to my, my little thing here. This is the place where I do my podcasts and look at episodes. And I've got the green one is coming next week and I've got the two yellow ones that are ready to go. So I'm up, I'm done for February. I don't feel pressure. There's no psychic weight to do that. With me so far? Feel free to interrupt. Uh, I said psychic weight. Let me talk about this a little bit. We'll talk about a little bit about productivity unless you guys have a, any questions or thoughts. You with me? Are you, are you like you buying what I'm selling? We go? Okay, cool. Blah, blah, blah. This is Darth Vader on a cat. <laughs> Just got to keep it frosty. Make sure you're paying attention. I've been co coding for a very long time. Uh, some, yeah, thank you very much. The one true way. Uh, that was, I was actually programming three years by the time I started that. Uh, I actually wrote the first diabetes management system on a Palm Pilot. Uh, I did it in 4K. That's, that's literally enough that you could, you could print memory out and put it on the ground and stand on a chair and see all 4K. And be like, oh, there's like a bite there that's wrong. That's literally that's how much you had. This was awesome. Like just, be, just because it's fun to talk about old stuff. You see that circle? That was the first time anyone ever drawn a circle on a Palm Pilot. And, and so my early in career people, any boot camp people here? Why would that be interesting? Like, oh, he drew a circle, yay, right? What do you need to draw a circle? What kind of thing do you need, boot camp people, to draw a circle? Uh, you need radius. You need math. Yeah. Math does not exist in a Palm Pilot. No. Palm Pilots only have integers. They have 8-bit integers. So how do you get a decimal point on an 8-bit integer? Well, you cut it in half and you say everything in the middle left is going to be on the left of the decimal point. Everything on the right of the decimal point is going to be on the other side of the decimal point. So you basically pretend that a, an unsigned integer is in fact cut in half and you treat it as a float. And then you go and find out that you don't have kind, sine or cosine or the ability to do any kind of math like that. Uh, and the screen is only 160 by 160. So instead, I made a constant array that represented the biggest screen I could imagine any computer could ever have, 1,000 by 1,000. And I made a 1,000 hard-coded, I generated it like at a command line and then pasted in a constant integer that represented a circle. And then held it in, in memory there and then shrunk it down to the size of the screen. Because, you know, what what device could ever have more than a thousand pixels. It's madness. Um, and then drew a circle. It was crazy. Like that was the best thing I've ever done in computer. 30 years of programming. Like n nothing makes you, like you just like, I mean, like stand up. Ever done that before? In any programmers, just like you're at home and you're hanging out with your partner and you're just like, <laughs> right? And you're like, and they're just like, don't care. <laughs> Whatever this is, I'm excited for you. I'm glad that you're glad that you drew a circle, right? 
Yeah, my wife is a nurse. Okay. So, blah, 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 blah. I've written all kinds of stuff. We talked about that. I wrote about being a phony. That was great. If you Google for phony, my face shows up, which is fun. <laughs> um, this is a picture of my son ignoring the light that I put up that would indicate that I was on a call. Yeah, it is very nice. Uh, I've talked about kids uh, and programming, square foot gardening for programmers, uh, building your own arcade cabinet, before and after shot. Uh, God help me, I wrote an app for the Windows phone. Um, I have a game called Baby Smash. I don't have any babies. Uh, it's not for smashing babies. It's for the baby to smash the keyboard and like stuff happens, and that's open source. Yeah, it's super awesome. So we got babies like rock on. My baby's 14, which is uh, problematic. Uh, I wrote a bunch of books that are trash. Um, I, uh, I'm working on a book right now called Relationship Hacks uh, about being married, being in a mixed marriage, where you have a geek and a normal person. <laughs> how you deal with that. Talk about the podcast. I have a couple podcasts. I got another one called This Developer's Life that is nothing at all like This American Life in no way. I have to say that for legal reasons. I did one on pop culture called Ratchet and the Geek. I've got a video you can download if you're interested. Get involved in tech. It's a two-hour free documentary about getting involved in tech, blogging, Twitter, Stack Overflow, conferences, user groups, and stuff like that. Do all of this because I enjoy it. Yay. Uh, when I went to Microsoft, actually, people said I was a sellout because I started in open source back in the early 90s. I was a, like a big open source person. And I went to Microsoft, and people were like, you're such a sellout. And I was like, it really made me feel sad. Like, that hurt my feelings. But some, <laughs> somehow I was able to work through those, uh, those feelings. That's a picture of me before Microsoft. Here's me after Microsoft. <laughs> Worked out pretty well. OK. So a lot of this is just advice, right? So like, feel free if you don't like the advice, you don't need to take any like. Okay, um, this actor that you don't know, back in the day, went and asked a question of this other actor that you don't know, and said, "How do you write a movie script?" And he said, "You get some paper, you put it in a typewriter, you type fade in, and you keep typing." <laughs> That's the way productivity advice was given in the uh, in the in the '60s and '70s. But if you want to scale yourself, you got to go back to the basics. You got to get down to computer science, right? The less stuff you do, the more you can do. Like if you do nothing, you can do it infinitely. That's a really good quote. I'm going to make that a quote. Okay, that's now a famous quote. Here's a graph that proves that if you do nothing, it has high throughput, <laughs> extremely high throughput, uh, nothing. Now there was a time when you could know all the information, right? You could know everything because there was like basically two books, but now everything's just 1,000 plus. Does anyone have like 30, 40, 50,000 items in their inbox in their iPhone, and you don't even like see it anymore? Like it is like the little the little badge. It's like 50,000. You just don't care. Like you could turn the badge off, right? Like it's telling you that you suck, and you just don't care. You're like, ah, I'm never going to read those emails. Just Control A, archive, just so they don't. They don't, like, they're not teasing you. Now, when I was developing software in the 80s, there was no internet. There were these two books. And that was the sum total of all information. So it was really easy to focus, because you would sit down in the basement with these two books. And then if you had a question, you could put it on either FidoNet. You can Google that. Or you could use, actually, you'd Lycos. And then you could go on a BBS, ask a question. And then in about four or five weeks, someone would answer you <laughs> and go, I also have that question. <laughs> right? The only kind of comparable feeling for the young people for you to have is if you ever like posted a question, then years later Googled, found yourself asking the question, and there's still no answer, that is like true loneliness. You know what I mean? Like just the profound depth of loneliness. But now we have people being interrupted all the time, right? People are constantly being interrupted. And we find ourselves in these situations where we feel like we're failing. And what I am trying to do is to make people talk about that. There is no safe place at Big Co, Nike, Intel, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, Amazon, whatever, to go and talk to your coworker and say, I feel like a failure. Because they are keeping the fact that they feel like a failure to themselves. And we all just pretend like we're all just crushing it. And then we go home. And then we say, you know, I'm just going to work late a little bit just to catch up. Because, you know, it's a busy time, like February kind of time frame, that February, March. Just February, March, April, kind of, you know, May, June, July, August, kind of like just the September, October, November, you know, January, February, March kind of time frame is busy. And once I get past that over the hump, 
it'll be awesome, right? And then we hope that things will work out, but hope is not a strategy. And no one talks about it. So what I've broken down is a couple of concepts from uh, Stephen Covey, a couple of concepts from David Allen, uh, and, and synthesize them into a system that helps me get centered and be deliberate in my practice. Now, I give this talk all over the world, uh, and every time I go to a new place, I put the word for the thing I'm about to talk about in the language. Uh, the thing that's interesting, though, anyone speak a non-English language? What you got? Japanese. Japanese. Uh, what's the word for effectiveness in Japanese? Think about that. You can Google it if you need to. OK, what's the word for efficiency in Japanese? Okay, Google those pick, Google those two words for me. Who else had another foreign language? What you got? Kaopindi bolsakte, huh? Nine bahat bahat kaminti jantun. Effectiveness, efficiency. What are the words in Hindi? Okay, you check that. Anyone else? Any other languages? What you'll find is for many many languages, it's the same word. So even for English speakers, what's the difference between effectiveness and efficiency in English? Well, I don't know, is it? You, you, he says not a lot. Anyone got a definition for effectiveness and efficiency? Even as a native English speaker, I think what do you got? Is, you're not just doing something, but you're doing it in the minimum amount of time and effort. Which one's that? Efficiency or effectiveness? Efficiency. That's efficiency for you. Effectiveness is more like it, it achieves its purpose in the end. Oh, that's good. I like that. That's good stuff. So I call it like this effectiveness is doing right things. Setting a target, it's goal oriented. I'm going to run a race. Which direction do I run? That's the finish line. I will run that way. Very effective. Running this way would be somewhat ineffective. Efficiency is doing things in an economical way. So once I've picked my direction, now I'm going to haul ass. But if you go and translate, like in the Spanish, they'll literally put the same words together. Did Japanese have the same? Yeah, so it, it, they, they, they mixed it. You'll find this in many, many languages. This is how I like to phrase it. So that's a good take a picture shot. Efficiency, doing the right things. No, effectiveness. See, I did it myself. See how hard this is? This is important. Effectiveness is doing the right things. I am an effective person at this task. And then efficiency, doing things right. Good stuff. Is this effective? Depends. You jumped the wrong way. How do we make these decisions though? We have all this crap coming into our lives, all this information that's coming in, and it needs to be triaged. I love language. I love looking at language and parsing it out. Do you know where this word is from? What language that's from? Because English steals everything. French. Exactly. It's a word that means to sift, to separate, but you can dig more into that. When we think about triage, what do we really think about? We think about war, zombies, apocalypse, toe tags. Right? When it gets, when the stuff goes down, and you know that there aren't a lot of software engineers on The Walking Dead. So think about your skill set. I'm just saying. <laughs> there wasn't a guy in The Walking Dead that was like, quick, I need someone to reboot the router. And then there's like, I can do it. <laughs> no, they want you to chop things and lift things. So we're all dead. Unless you have a skill. I saw there's a utility kilt around here somewhere, and that guy's probably got like a knife. So there's no, potential. No, no, no. You don't have a knife? No? You're supposed to. You're supposed to have a knife in your sporran. Yeah. yeah. Utility, man. Utility. Like if all of us, I thought it was going to be you, you're going to die. And the next time it might be too late. <laughs> so when stuff goes down, how do you triage it? Well, triage is very effective. You're on the battlefield and you say, are you dead? Are you walking wounded? Get off my battlefield. You're fine. You have to be aggressive when you're going to survive a war like that. You have to do the same thing with your email. You know that one email that you've had in your inbox that's so important, so very important that you haven't answered it yet? Because you need to give it the time it deserves in order to answer it. And it will just sit there and it's been there. You ever have an email from like last August? You need it there. It has to be there because it will be answered. It's important. That person may die. I've actually had this happen. People will die and I felt bad. I never got back to them. And like now that email bounces, which is super sad. So answer your emails or just declare that you're not going to do it. Be aggressive. 
there's work that comes into your life. And David Allen uh, thinks about it like this. There's predefined work, work that you have set up ahead of time, like we're going to paint the house this weekend. There's work as it appears, like quick, do this. That work just appeared. And then there's the work of defining work. The work that we don't do is defining work. Does anyone have a meeting on their calendar anywhere at all in the week to figure out what the hell you're doing? What do you got? That's great. I love that. What do you got? Mondays, Wednesdays, when do you meet Wednesdays. and touch? Is it just by yourself or do you have people there? Uh, part of it's by myself, but then a lot of it's with this guy here. Rock on. Superstar. Love that. What do you got? Day prep. Day prep. When do you do it? Every day or like once a week? Uh, five days a week and then once or Saturday. Whoa! Saturday day prep. That is impressive. Very, no, I mean, that's awesome. It sounds small, but there's a moment there when you, you just need to go, what the hell am I doing? Busyness is kind of an illusion, and it's also a form of laziness. Being overly busy is a kind of laziness. We'll talk about that. When you have some work then, the only things you can do to it is do it, drop it, delegate it, give it to somebody else, or uh, defer it, don't do it. Now, if you take David Allen's D's and you take Stephen Covey's uh, productivity, urgency, importance stuff, and you overlay the two. So this is merging two productivity concepts. Importance on your vertical axis, urgency across the horizontal axis. Things that are both urgent and important, house is on fire, baby's coming, do it now. Build is broken, website down, do it now. Things that are neither urgent nor important, dump it. If something's super, super important but not yet currently on fire, planning meeting, awesome. Until it becomes a problem. Like, I'll give you an example of a thing that's currently in my head. I've got this blog had it for a few years. I thought it was on a virtual machine. Didn't think about it. I, I got a free uh, hosting deal years ago from a company called OrcsWeb. They never sent me a bill. It's been 17 years. Nothing's happened. Forgot my password. Decided to go and find out what's going on. OrcsWeb doesn't exist anymore. My blog still exists, though. How is that a thing? Turns out OrcsWeb got bought by a French company and, or Quebec, close enough, and they bought all that stuff. So I was like, oh, okay, fine. My virtual machine is in Quebec. Cool, rock on. Hey, can you send me a copy of my virtual machine so I can run it in like a proper cloud? I, don't, I can't do Quebec, but they're like, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, it's on the old hardware. Uh, okay, well, that's cool. Where is it? Oh, it's right here. <laughs> what do you mean right here? No, it's under my desk. I'm on the phone with Francois, and they literally took some of the servers from the acquisition and they just shoved it under his desk. It's never been on a virtual machine. He can touch it. <laughs> like, I, he can put his hand on the hard drive. I can push refresh in Oregon. He goes, oh, that was you. <laughs> That's not OK. You know what the MTBF is, right? Anyone know what MTBF stands for? Mean time before failure. How long do hard drives last? Five years. My thing's been on the same hard drive for 17 years. This is a huge problem. In the back of my mind, it was down here. And now it's slowly making its way over here. It's not quite urgent, but here's the deal. One day, it's going to be freaking urgent. And I'm like freaking out. Because I have to go and like move the whole thing. And this is like 15, 16, 17 year old software. Like I'm running .NET, you know, 2.0, and like that's nine .NETs ago. And i and the whole thing is done in XML. So like <laughs> uh, and I, you know, because you know, it was the time. Like we didn't know what we were doing, kids. We just we thought it was a good idea. <laughs> Each it is the new hot. It's it will rise again, my friend. You think that curly braces are where it's at? No, man. Angle brackets, right? It's the same thing. Nothing. You all think that Jason is cute. It's not cute. It's still just XML, but with curly braces. So that's another conversation. YAML, the curly braces you can't see them. They're still there. <laughs> it's totally still there. Again, no. I'm gonna be like old man who shakes fist at cloud, and that's fine. You know what I mean? They're gonna just roll me out, and I'll be like, XML was the way. <laughs> 
SGML, where's my DTDs? Look all that stuff up. I actually worked on a product that I, was, <laughs> I kid you not, called XML. XML it? I was probably one of the big fans of that product. Point is, this is becoming very, very urgent. And actually, I have one XML file for each blog post, so there's like 47,000 you know, XML. It's a whole thing. So what is currently in preparation phase is soon to become a crisis. But things that are not important, but still super fun to do, interruptions. Interruptions are so fun. You know why people like interruptions? Interruptions are a drug. Interruptions are pseudo important. They make you feel, oh, I have to take this call. I'm sorry. I'm very, <laughs> I'm very important. Your phone, your, the, all the little vibration, all the little notifications. Oh, that's all just hiccups. Hiccups in your life, slowing you down. You think that Usain Bolt runs as fast as he can and then gets like a little vibration on his watch and he's like, oh, look at that. You can't sprint full on if you're being interrupted. Turn all that shit off, all the notifications, all the toast. Remember when Skype was an app that we would actually use to talk to people? And now it's just a thing that reminds me of strangers' birthdays. Just like random, like, oh, it's so-and-so's birthday you Skyped eight years ago. Like, thank you, Skype. That little piece of toast that, like, pops up or, like, comes in from the side. Like, I was coding. And, oh, okay. what am I doing? Where do I work? What's my password? All those things slow you down. No joke. Urgency. Twitter, great example. This is a picture of a mouse with an electrical wire in his brain. And he just has to pull on this little lever to refresh the serotonin, to refresh that sense of positivity, that sense of I'm okay. Just, just pull to refresh. Just pull to refresh, and he gets a feeling that I'm gonna be all right, that I'm gonna be okay. You have to catch yourself in those moments when you're scrolling idly through Facebook or through Instagram and ask yourself, is this doing anything for me other than improving my serotonin? If it does improve your serotonin, that's great. Just know that it is, acknowledge that it is. Remember when, if, see that's the other, that's a great, I love that you brought that up because like we went to middle school together, right? Um, do you ever like go through Facebook or whatever and you're like, oh, I'm gonna go to Facebook, see how they're, oh, they're on a jet, oh. I'm not on a jet. Like it's like it's a system literally designed to make me feel bad about myself. And I'm not even really friends with those people. Like like we hung out like on New Year's Eve because we're friends, but the other like friends, I don't hang out with them. Like I see them on Facebook like oh you got a baby like mm, good for you. Like but I haven't seen them in 25 years. I just don't care. So I got to let it go. Remember when Jesus uh had had the whole thing with the two with the fit the footprints. Remember, you're walking on the beach, and there's only that's when he unfollowed you on Twitter. That's why there's one there's only one set of footprints because he's like, you tweet too much, you need to stop. Any system that can succeed has flow control. If you know anything about TCP/IP or you've learned about this kind of stuff, you'll know that like 20 or 30 percent of your packets are being dropped. That's okay. Communication by its nature is fault tolerant. That's why people can call each other multiple times. Why texting is asynchronous. Dropping the ball is the right answer for your mental health, for your getting stuff done. Unless you are this guy and that's your job, don't just, just drop stuff. You don't need to do those things. Here is a guy surfboarding in the space on a crocodile. <laughs> Stay focused, people. Now, when we think about our well-being and our health and our anxiety and those kinds of things, I came up with this term called psychic weight. Um, does anyone remember when, when TiVos came out? There was like, like a what do you call them, DVRs, right? Right, you're like there was a moment, like remember, did anyone, you're how old are you? You're probably like 30. 30. Okay, did you ever, do you remember like making an appointment to watch TV? Like let's all get together on Thursday and like watch TV. Mm -hmm. Right, you're the last generation that will ever do that, right? Mm -hmm. Like my kids, they don't like, Seinfeld Thursdays at eight and they all get together and they watch it. Appointment TV. Then one day the TiVo happened and then there was like the Law and Order channel, and you don't know what you're doing. You're like, Law and Order, click, I wanna watch that episode. Well, click, click, I'll just watch them all. Then you come back and there's like 97 episodes of Law and Order, and then you're like, what was a joy? What was the greatest thing since God talked to Moses is now a to-do list of things that you're never gonna do. 
I have never seen The Wire. I am told, I know, I'm told it's very good, but it's a commitment. It's like seven seasons. We're talking about like 40 or 50 hours of my life. And I have to be conscientious about is that 50 hours the ones I need? Are that, is that going to help my anxiety? Am I going to be able to get something out of it? The psychic weight of the TiVo literally was causing my wife and I to put the kids down early. And be like, okay, we'll put them down early. I'll call in sick tomorrow. We're just going to bang through Dexter and we're going to get it done. And then it's done. And of course, the Dexter finale was just a dumpster fire. So like, just forget that the last season ever happened. Just stop at John Lithgow. Point is, letting things go is the number one tool that you can have for your mental health and your sense of productivity. Saying no to your coworkers, to your friends, to your family is how you stay sane, it's how you stay positive. Oh, I wish that I had more, more time in the day. How do you have so much time? You have like 27 hours. I get the same number of hours you have. What are the things that you're doing? What is the 24 hour? Like chart every 20 minutes and ask yourself, what did I do during that time? And say, was that value add? Could I get out of that? And then you'll get yourself another 90 minutes a day. Now, here's the thing though, here's the problem. I like television a lot, but I can't spend that kind of time. So what's some feasible multitasking? What could I do? What success system could I set up where I might be able to watch the TV that I want? I just binged on October Faction, fantastic show, 10 hours. What could I do and also watch TV? Work out, bingo. I made a deal with myself that I'm only allowed to watch TV when I'm on the treadmill. One more episode, that's one more hour, that's three more miles. That's the trick, that's the trick. Actual feasible multitasking. Being able to set that up allowed me to be conscious and focused about that. Catching myself in bed on my side with the iPhone, going like, is this my life now? Is this what we're doing? This is a thing now. If that's what you need, if that's what you need to recharge, do it, but do it intentionally. Does that make sense? Now my buddy, JD Meyer at gettingresults.com has this idea of the rule of three. Everyone's heard of a version of this rule. The idea is that everyone's got these lists of shit to do and it's too big. The only thing that we can really do is three things. So if you have three things of varying scope, what could you do tomorrow to set yourself up for success and do three things where you would feel so awesome about it? Like rather, you ever go home just feeling bad? Like I don't even know what I did today. Like I fixed the bill, what was that? And then you just go, all right, I'm just gonna do better tomorrow. And then each day is just more piles of crap like that. What could you do with your three things that you could do before lunch? You could do two of them before lunch and one in the afternoon and be like, oh, I just crushed my day. In order to pick three, you have to say no to a bunch. Then you expand the scope and you have three things for the week and then three things for the year. To, to this young lady's example, Monday, make a plan, make a meeting with yourself, 9 a.m. What's your vision for the week? Friday, reflection, how did it go? What worked, what didn't? And reflection has to also turn into forgiveness. Yeah, fuck this week up, was not awesome, did my best. This is some things that didn't work out. I got interrupted. The build happened. My website went down and I totally didn't do X, Y, Z. Own it, move on, and Monday is a new week to start all over again. You're not going to answer those emails. You're just never going to answer them. Control A, archive. They're not going anywhere. They're just not in your inbox. Totally serious. Now, remember what I said that busy is a form of laziness? It's because busy, overtly busy, overly busy. Oh, I'm far too busy to have very important. That kind of busy is non-deliberate. I'm so busy because I'm just putting fires out. I really respect when I have a boss or a person who's important in my life at my work, actually sit down and hang out with me. So that example that I made before about you answer, you ask me a really great question. It's not that I'm too busy to hang out with you. We don't, we don't not, we're not like that. You're not my mentee or uh, you're not my, my person I'm in a relationship. Therefore, I am choosing to consciously protect myself and prioritize. I will give you the gift of my keystrokes because what a great question. Every good question, every good technical question is a gift because every one of them is a potential blog post. So if I go to my to-do list, I use the to-do app, Microsoft to-do, it used to be Wonderlist. These are all 
blog post ideas. Every single time someone says, hey, blog something, I throw it in there. I will never run out of stuff to blog about. Then I go to my day. I click on the idea button and I say, oh, I could do that and I could do that and I could do that. And I make a very small list and I check those things off. There's always a backlog. This is agile as applied to your life. Make sense? It's the intentionality that we fail to do, in my opinion. Now, you ever like go hang out with your friends and there's someone who's not around and they're not around for like a while and then out of nowhere they pop back and they like wrote a book or did a PDF or made a whole business or made a website. Like, holy shit, that was amazing. Because being creative is the opposite of hanging out. Now, in, in high school, we used to hang out like super late, like 2 a.m., 3 a.m., because we had FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. Because every time you would not hang out late, you would, you would like, someone would be like, oh, dude, after you left, whoa. Like the hologram of Prince came and they did a whole set. It was amazing. Oh. Never happens. Never, ever happens. Think about yourself. If you want to hang out with them in the lobby of the hotel until 2 a.m. and see what happens, cool, but do it with intention. But that four hours, that five hours, it's easy to blow time like that hanging out with people. Would have made you more successful on your test, in your boot camp, in that open source project you're working on or whatever. We live in a very complicated time right now. It's easy to have a lot of malaise. Someone is always wrong on the internet. You're not going to change their vote. It's not going to happen. They're going to believe what they're going to believe, and no one's going to be like, oh my god, I was going to vote for so-and-so, but then I saw this tweet. And that turned the tide of the election for me because of that tweet. Thank god that person in bed on their side on their iPhone at 3 in the morning just could not sleep and then tweeted that thing that I saw. Let it go. Here's some homework for you. Take uh, this list. This is just my list. Your list is going to be different. Identify the streams of crap that come into your life. An inbox isn't about email. An inbox is about everything. It could be your property taxes. It could be a ticket to a concert or a Broadway show that you're going to go to. It could be physical. It could be virtual. Take it. Identify the streams and sort them. Signal versus noise. This is mine. Now, I like talking on the phone. I like FaceTime. I like synchronous communication with humans. When I'm stressed out, though, this is the sorted list. This is the least important. That's the most important. I draw a line. And the way I make up time, the way I free up time to work on the stuff I want to work on is by dropping stuff. You know how we always do out of office emails? You ever have someone who do like an out of office email? They're not really out of office or just like, here's my out of office thing to tell you I'm too busy to answer email. People do that for work, but they never do that for personal. Do that. Make a personal out of office and just say, I'm not answering email for the next month. I'm writing a book. I got a thing. I'm working out. I'm doing my black belt or whatever. I'm not going to watch TV. I'm going to make these things go away. And that's how you get one, two, three, five hours a day. That's how you make these hours appear. Um, this is huge if you have any kind of an email situation. Uh, this was the biggest email rule game changer. I would encourage you if you have Outlook or anything like that in your life. I have 240 emails here. Notice that two-thirds of them are in an inbox called CC'd. The young people can go and look up what a carbon copier is. Uh, I put the CC'd stuff, stuff where I'm not to, in another inbox. And I only check it once a week. FYI, this isn't do a task. This is FYI. Game changer. Cut my email down by two-thirds. Now, you might say, well, my boss has a tendency to put stuff on cc that I need to do. Don't do it. Only has to happen once. You train people how to treat you. They will learn. Oh, OK, so if it's important, put you on two. Cool, handled. Make sense? Now, here's a real challenge. Unless your job, like your LinkedIn is like emailer, that's like your title, <laughs> try this tomorrow. Don't check email in the morning. Don't roll out of bed and check your tweets. You don't get to. Yes, sir. Yeah, any notification, Slack, whatever. I want you to do this for me and try it out. You can tweet me later. Let me know how it works. Don't respond to any notifications until noon. And what's going to happen is you're not going to know what to freaking do to yourself. You're not. You're going to like ah. You. We don't even know how to poop without a phone. Like that's where we're at right now. So, what's your job? What do you want to get done tomorrow on Wednesday? 
You don't get to check any notifications in the morning. Put your phone in your pocket. Put it on airplane mode. Airplane mode works on the ground. <laughs> Shocker. It's a thing. Do not put energy into things you don't want more of. You know how when you're just starting out early in career, people are going to have this happen. You're going to be on the Slack. You're going to get these notifications at 2 in the morning on a Sunday, and you're going to reply. You just taught your boss that you're that person. You just taught them that that is the boundary. Slack, Teams, Outlook, they all have do not disturb. My phone goes into do not disturb at 7 o'clock. I'm even using screen time on my iPhone to dim apps that I don't want to be using. You should also do that. Use the same child controls to block yourself from doing stuff that is unhealthy that you would do to a child. Does that make sense? And we talked about keystrokes. Blah, 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 skipping, skipping, skipping. Oh, physical stuff. Oh, work sprints. Anyone do Pomodoro? You have to you know what the Pomodoro is? Pomodoro? 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 A Pomodoro is like, I think it's Italian for tomato. It's a little tomato timer, and it goes for 25 minutes. Think of it as a unit of time. Someone says, hey, can you do this little bit of code for me? Eh, it's about two Pomodoros. It's about an hour. You get five minutes to pee. You've got to do this thing. You've got to do it once without stopping at a sprint. What can you do for 25 minutes without doing anything else? You focus on the task. Try that. It's really freaking hard. You'll find yourself at Reddit. You'll alt tab to other random places. And all of a sudden, you're going to be like, I don't know. I'm on Reddit now. I was writing code, and now I'm looking at cats. How, I don't know what happened, right? Sprints. This is just agile applied to yourself. Think about the things that happened during that sprint, that 25 minutes. Did you interrupt yourself? Did you get anxious? Did someone interrupt you? Did you get called? Write it down. Sprint again and see if you can reduce that number of interruptions lower. Here is uh, Pee Wee Herman saving some snakes from a fire. There are internal interruptions. Like you're just hanging out and you're just like, whoa, no, I'm playing solitaire. And I'm like, really good at solitaire. <laughs> And then there's external interruptions where like your boss is like, hello. The reason that we interrupt ourselves is that we think we're going to miss out on something. For a lot of us, like 9-11 was a thing that we were like, when that happened, it changed how we thought about news. And a lot of us spent a lot of time like, what's going to, what's happening? Like, is the world ending? Like a climate change has got me stressed out, but did, did it, whatever it is, happen? And I missed it. If we can really acknowledge to ourselves that everything that is important will find itself to you many times. Did you hear about whatever? You'll hear. Someone will tell you. You don't need to go and check whatever the news website is and refresh it. Stay in your flow. Catch yourself in that runner's high, whatever that is, while you are coding or knitting or whatever makes you happy. Focus on wrapping yourself up in the thing that captures your attention, and you'll feel like this guy. I think this is really interesting when people think that multitasking is a thing. Speaking on the phone, to talk to humans synchronously. Computer science, the optimal number of threads in any system is one. As soon as you multitask, you have to context switch. And if you context switch, that's a load. You've just lowered you know, 3%, 5%, 10%. Here is a really good example of a bad multitasker. You know what we call them in Oregon, right? Organ donors. <laughs> Seriously, that's, that's awful. Put your phone in the trunk. Focus on what you're doing. The only true multitasking is this. His eyes are moving, too. I worked really hard on that gift. Remember I talked about guilt systems? Don't set them up. Blah, 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 Ta, stuff you don't need to see. Some suggestions. Rescue time. Anyone use Rescue Time? It's a lovely app. Runs in the background and will chart and graph the app in front. If you don't know you're on Reddit or you're wherever you're not supposed to be and you care, you can't cut it out of your life unless you measure it. What's a healthy amount of time dicking around online? Never. I disagree. That's, hust that's a hustle mentality. and We reject that. Yeah, do you? Yeah. That's why you succeed. Yeah. 
Um, this this was interesting to me, uh, where I was noticing that I was messing around from one to four a.m. every day. I didn't know that. That sucks. Don't do that. I needed to see the chart to know it was a bad idea. This here was interesting. This was a Monday where I did nothing. That's when my appendix burst. <laughs> Something. Not a huge deal. What's what's wrong with Tuesday though? You did anything at all after you Exactly. I was in the hospital in Outlook the next day. And then working on Wednesday. Very dumb. You got to see the chart to go, wow, that is not the chart I would have expected to see. Now we talked about physical things. I'll try to wrap it up really quickly here. Um, physical things that tickle your brain. You go, oh yeah, that thing, right? There's all kinds of physical stuff that come into your life. Like uh, we have uh, tickets to the Broadway, Portland Broadway thing, right? You like buy it once a year and then tickets show up. And they're pretty random. And we don't even, we're like literally like, what are we doing this weekend? Oh crap, we have tickets to Fiddler on the Roof or whatever. And we forget about these tickets. And then again, you gotta go looking for the tickets. Like where are they? They're in the drawer with all the USB cables or whatever. What you can do is you can do 43 folders, 12 folders for the month, 31 folders for the days. You make a circular buffer. So right now we are on what? What is today? The fourth. So you'd have four, five, six, seven, and all the way to 28. Then you'd have March, April, May, whatever. And then as the days and the months move, you take it and you move it to the back. So if I get a ticket for something in April, I pick it up, I stick it in April, and I forget about it. And then when April comes back around, I open it up. Works for any physical thing, only takes up this much space. You get one of the little suitcase filing cabinet deals at Home Depot, that's the sum total of all paper in your house, period. Bills, it makes everything go away. Isn't that cool? Speaking of paper, my dad, he was trying, he's a firefighter, and he's not technical, and he was really struggling with the whole iPad thing. Um, and you know, keeping a charge and all that kind of stuff. So we just made him one. Three by five, three by five cards. You go to Hipster PDA. It's an actual thing. Just Google Hipster PDA, and you print out this stuff, and you get one of those big snappy deals, and he puts it in his back pocket. It's got Retina display, infinite battery, makes him feel very comfortable, and he's got the things that he wants to do, just handled. I'm not joking. People forget paper. Paper's where it's at. When you're stressed out, when you're freaking out, I don't know about you, we all have our, our thing that we do when we are anxious. If I'm overwhelmed, I clean my room, take everything off my desk and put it back on my desk and I get a haircut. I've accomplished nothing, but at least I've got the hair and the desk handled. If you're really stressed out, you can't figure it out by looking at an 11 inch MacBook Air, you just can't. You gotta get a big old piece of butcher paper or something and you go, okay, I was stressed out about my year. I printed out 12 calendars and I looked at them and I said, okay, I can see, I can stand up and look at my year. If you do that with an 11 inch MacBook Air, you just end up being really far away from a screen you can't see. Find a whiteboard, paint a whiteboard, paint a wall in your house with a whiteboard, with the whiteboard or the chalkboard paint and go, what the hell am I doing? We actually did that one better and I would recommend that you do this as well. Does anyone have a DAC board in their house? No, oh, I love you people. Look at this, kids. Go to Goodwill and buy a $20 monitor. It's gotta be 1080p. Take a Raspberry Pi, you all have one lying around. Go and install the DAC board software. You shove the Raspberry Pi in the back of the monitor and it loads up, opens Chrome, goes full screen and auto refreshes every five minutes has my Google Calendar, has family pictures, the weather. It is beautiful, sir. It is beautiful. And because I'm that nerd, because I'm that nerd, I actually have my blood sugar, because I'm a type one diabetic, on a screen in the house in a picture frame. So when I'm remote, they can see my medical implants that show my blood sugar in the cloud and tell that daddy's okay even when I'm in another country. That then is a REST API for my own body, which then shows up on the Raspberry Pi, which I can then mount. It is freaking awesome. Yes, I love that you're excited about it. No one else cares, you <laughs> bastards. You can then rotate it, put, um, you know, like art, paintings, put it in like a cool frame. If you're really cool, go and Google for magic mirror. You get one-way glass. 
and then it's a mirror, and then you walk in front of it, and a motion detector, and then it's like, oh, space, you know, it's like Arnold Schwarzenegger in the Mars movie or whatever, right? I'm telling you. And all this stuff, totally free. That seriously, I got that at Goodwill. Like I'm at Goodwill all the time. If you go check out my Instagram feed, my Instagram feed, it's literally me at, at Goodwill. It sounds silly, but it's like literally, that's all I do. Like I found this Palm Pilot at Goodwill. This is a Dreamcast that I got recently at Goodwill. Uh, I modded it to support. Um, I modded the Dream Dreamcast, and I, I put an SD card inside it, which is kind of badass, if I may say so. I'm like, oh, it's a Dreamcast. What SD card? Um, this, you know, kind of stuff that you have on an Instagram. It's all meant to make you feel good about yourself, right? Don't you look at my 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 Instagram and you're just like, what is he doing? Bunnies, good stuff. Yeah, I'm winning at life, man. It's all just, it's there to make people I went to high school with feel bad about themselves. Um, it's just meant to make you feel bad, Kristen. This is a quote that I like, but I don't like all of it. It says, if it's not helping me make money, it's not improving my life in some way, it's mental clutter. I'm going to remove the money part. If it's not helping me to blank, whatever blank is, Improve your relationships, get promoted at work, learn how to code, whatever. I want you to take all the things in your life, sort them, measure them. It can be toxic relationships, it can be your roommate, it can be the TV show that you're never going to finish. Is it moving you towards your goal? If it's not, out. That's it. And here's the deal though. Willpower is a well that has to be replenished. This is not hustle. Culture, I'm not telling you, you need to try harder, you need to work harder. What you need to do is you need to wake up every morning in a place of forgiveness. Say, yeah, okay, yesterday sucked, but today is a day to do it all over again. And this is what I'm going to do today. I'm going to have a salad instead of, a, instead of two burritos. That's what I'm going to do after this. I'm not going to eat the entire bag of chips. You can actually ask for baby chips at Chipotle. Just say, I want the baby chips, and then you won't eat an entire bag of chips. Because that's 1,200 calories. Just say baby chips, they keep them underneath the counter. It's a carbohydrate little tip for you there. I'd like a burrito and a baby chips. It's kind of like getting a double Whopper and a Diet Coke. It's kind of that, that bit of irony. Here's your homework. Sort your sources. Think about work sprints. Go and look, about, look onto the Pomodoro technique. Anything that distracts you, anything, just go into your iPhone or your Android phone and settings, notifications, turn them all off. The only notifications I care about is like the alarm for the house. I'm trying to think, like is the house on fire or like my wife texts me. Speaking of texts, you can go into your phone and you can make it not buzz for anybody except important people. I did that. I went to my faves, they beat my phone. Randos, don't beat my phone. Turn all that shit off. You will not know what to do with the quiet. Then go look at your personal toolbox and consider the tools that you're using. Consider a tool like rescue time, etc. And then, of course, follow me on Twitter. Uh, and now I've taken up a little bit of your time, sir. All your time, sir. Well, no, I mean, you, you had some stuff to talk about. Anyway, that's my spiel. There's like another hour there. I could do like a whole workshop. But do you, you get like why it's such a great time to be a programmer right now and how we can go out and kick ass tomorrow? And only one person left. <laughs> and I judged him quietly, but I said nothing. <laughs> when he left. And he probably left because this wasn't feeding his spirit, and that's okay. That's a great reason. See, that's freaking awesome. Someone actually got mad at me because I don't want to go to the Ukraine to talk to 250 programmers. And he was, we were going back and forth. He was being all sassy. I'm like, dude, it's the Ukraine. Like, it's like going to take me two days to get there. Oh, but we love you here in the Ukraine. Ah, ah. And I said, dude, 365 days a year, four more years of my 14-year-old, it's going to take me seven days. Now, is it, a, is it a summertime? I could take my son with me? That'd be awesome. I'll take him with me. Well, no, it's in April. During when? Oh, it's during spring break. I'm not going to your conference. Like, I'd love to, but no. Saying no. So yes, going home to see the babies before bed? Apps freaking lootly. Hell yeah, I love that. That's, what I, that's my whole thing right now. Dig it. Any questions, comments, thoughts? Anyone disagree with anything, anything I said or think any feedback where I can make this suck less? Sure. Deep work by Cal Newport goes with a lot of this stuff. OK, yeah. deep work. Deep work, yeah. All right. That was a revolution for me. Yeah. And essentially,
Essentialism. Yes, atomic I habit. Essentialism. Excellent. I dig it. Are you doing those things though? So both I of am. you know those things. So that, so this was all like old school for you. No, this is great. Everybody cool. Everybody has their own take on some of these ideas. And, uh, you got to do it. That's the thing. And then you got to understand that you're not going to do it all the time. And then you got to forgive yourself and then just do it the next day. Cool. Do you want to do your thing? I would love to do my thing. Excellent. I will t unplug and I will release this to you.